said, yeah, doing really well. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me on the podcast. No problem at all. How are you finding uh, lockdown that we're in at the moment? Is it uh, easy going for you and the family or, or more stressful? Well, I, guess, I guess we're quite sort of rehearsed now, aren't we? This is lockdown three. Um, so we, we know what we're dealing with. But uh, to be fair, we're a family of five, you know, three small children and they enjoy it. My wife kind of enjoys it. And I get to work in, in peace in my office. So it's, it's not too bad. Yeah. And uh, homeschooling, is that all down to your wife or are you, you getting involved as well? Um, I, I get involved in the complicated maths questions, but other than that, my, my wife's doing a tremendous job. She really, she really is a homemaker. She loves being with the children. So yeah, it's working out quite well. Oh, fantastic. I, I, I love the, uh, the fact that you can, when, you, when the kids are home, you can have lunch with them, share their stories, see how well they're doing with their schoolwork. I, I love it. But um, anyway, we, we better get on with the conversation. So um, I wanted to start with your, your first job. I wondered what it was. Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess it depends whether you mean my first proper job or the first time I tried to go and earn some cash. But when I was at school, I was the kind of youngest in my year group. So all my friends were, uh, as we completed our GCSEs, they, they were turning 16 and off getting jobs and, and becoming more independent. I was still just 15. And uh, I wasn't employable at that time. So um, i kind of dreamt up a, a kind of business that I could go cleaning windows. I took some inspiration from my uncle. So he used to drag me out on weekends as cheap labor because he <laughs> realized that, so he had some corporate contracts with, uh, you know, with his window cleaning business and he would basically uh, clean up a whole business park. So he would do this big building, this big building. And he kind of figured that I was big enough and, and you know, capable enough of cleaning a building as well as him. So he was kind of doubling up his time efficiency. And I said, look, uncle, this is great. And you slipped me 20 pounds here or there. I said, but how about you give me all of your old gear and let me go and do this myself? So yeah, the age of 15, I was uh, off becoming a window cleaner, but my mum then chipped in and said, hey, I think you're a bit young to be climbing up and down ladders and you're not insured and you don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so we had to compromise that I could only clean bungalows. So at the age of 15, <laughs> me and about three of my friends, we, we managed to accumulate this decent uh, window cleaning round, but specifically for bungalows. Um, then one or two people criticized me for sort of exploiting the elderly, which was never my, never my intention. I was uh, doing it very, very, you know, good rates for them. But yeah, that was my first, I guess, business um then my first proper job was uh, working as a sales assistant in in a jewelry shop which i really really enjoyed fantastic and um how did you then get to where you are now as the the, the managing director of a a group of franchises yeah good good question i'm still trying to figure that out um <laughs> So for me, my, uh, the backbone of my career has always been, you know, sales and marketing. Um, so growing up as a, as a sales assistant in the jewelry trade, you know, taught me so much. Um, and I guess I kind of built on that. And then from my jewelry days, I then went into another form of luxury retail. So that was, that was attractive to me at the time because I, I kind of knew what I was doing and, and it was a company called Venture Photography. Um, and as I say, they were selling, you know, these beautiful luxury portraits to people, um, wonderful photography that they could put in their homes. And, and this was pre digital photography, by the way, or on the cusp. So we yeah. certainly didn't have iPhones or, or SLR cameras that, that did an amazing job, you know, so we, we were providing that service it just so happened to be a franchise ed. So I, I, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that when I joined, I just knew it was a luxury retail business that was attractive to me. Um, so I, I kind of soon fell in love with the franchise model. Um, and that was however many years ago, 15, 16 years ago. And then, you know, I've been in franchising ever since. So before you joined venture, uh, venture photography, um, what was your, impression of franchise and what did you think of the industry and and how how did being there change to the point that you loved franchising or the yeah, franchise model i i've got to be honest ed i was very ignorant to it you know i was um a, a young guy so i kind of didn't have uh, that that worldly knowledge i didn't understand what all of these business models really were um as much as as much as I knew about franchising was, you know, McDonald's and Burger King, you know, yeah. I, I thought, you know, it would just, it was a fast food, um, you know, kind of model 
that that people would just copy and, and and replicate. So that was about my limited knowledge, you know, as as a, as a young sort of twenty year old guy, as to you know what franchising was all about. And and my God, were my eyes then properly opened as I as I took a proper look. And and, and what key things sort of stood out then and perhaps now about the franchising industry that that makes you you want to stay within it because you know over your career you've you've, you've You've been in franchising for I don't know how many num- how many years, but quite quite a few years now, more than ten. Yeah, I think I think fifteen, sixteen years now. I, I lose count. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I think it's a, a wonderful model both for the franchisor. So it's a, an excellent way of growing your business um, quickly and and sharing the risk with a whole bunch of other entrepreneurs. So I think that's a, a great. Uh, a great thing for someone building their business, but also for the franchisees as well. You know, they they get to invest a, a smaller amount relative to starting any other type of um, business and cut out a lot of the risk. Um, and, and you get that whole collaboration of being part of a network with a system and a model and a whole best practice that you can follow. So I, I just think it's a, a win, win, win. And I add the extra win because I think the customers, I think the customers get more from a franchise business than they do from a wholly owned company, if I'm allowed to say that. And I, I, I say that, Ed, because it's that person's livelihood. You know, it's, yeah. it's everything to that franchisee. It's not just a job or oh, what time is it? Can I go home? Um, and maybe I haven't got time to, to go the extra mile for my customers because I've got somewhere else to be as an employed person. Um, as a franchisee, I think your business is your baby and, and you treat your customers, um, you know, with, with that real kind of red carpet treatment. So I, I, I think it's a win, 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 if, if I'm allowed to say that. Sure. And, and do you think that um, it's still your baby if you didn't come up with the idea or the concept or the system or procedures, you know, which is ultimately what you're, you're buying into when you buy a franchise license? Because um, yeah. I think some people might feel like that. It's okay, it's not really mine. I'm just borrowing it for a, for a time. What's, yeah, your, what's I, your experience I, with that? Yeah, so it's a good question, that, Ed. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, yes, largely speaking, yes, it is my baby because you've still got the blood, sweat and tears. And, and for a lot of people coming into franchising, it is their first time being self-employed. Um, so I, I think it's not like you you you've got a, a reference to oh well this isn't like running my old business for most people not all but for most people it's their um, introduction to self-employment and I think that's a you know a really special um, you know really special thing for people but having said that Ed I think both parties franchisee franchisor have to work really hard on the relationship because it yeah. is like it is like a marriage you know and there will be there will be, you know, ups and downs, and and there and there has to be that kind of um, counselling every every now and again to make sure that you know the relationship stays on track. Because, um, as I say, roller coasters do occur in business, and uh, and dare I say, you know, blame can creep in as well. Well, well, if you'd have done what you said you were going to do, or if you'd have done what you said you were going to do. So I think that's something that I pride myself on is is. Um, fostering the best relationships between franchisees franchisors because it's is a really important thing to to focus on so that's been your your, your main role over the last uh, yeah five ten years hasn't it really those relationships yeah. between franchisee and franchisor so um how how what challenges i guess is the, the question i'm going for what challenges have you found for people that are bought into a franchise business and how have you helped them through that process and adding on to this is that the franchisor's responsibility to help them through every challenge Mm -hmm. yes a great another great question um so yes that has been my my career over the last you know 10 15 years has been maintaining those relationships Uh, i think it starts from the off in fact it starts before the launch you know there's this um lengthy due diligence period before you shake hands on on the you know on the franchise, um, and I think it starts then. You know whether it's in your discovery days or in those first meetings to even talk about why that person might join the franchise. Um, so I think it starts there, and 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 you've got to you've got to know that you can get along at that point. You know, um, and I would you know I would I would uh, encourage all 
potential franchisees to make sure, do I like this person, these people? Do I like this company? Because if you're doubtful at that point, or you know that you don't like them at that point, then I, I wouldn't, um, you know, pardon the expression, I wouldn't get into bed with them because, you know, you, you're, yeah. you're spending, again, it's like a marriage, you know, it's five years, 10 years, maybe longer. And um, you've got to know you can, you can really kind of um, live with those people, um, so to speak. So, yeah. And then you asked Ed, um, if, if things do, you know, do sort of um, take a, you know, a bumpy ride, who's, you know, who, whose responsibility is that? I think, again, it's both, you know, I think it's both. Um, we, we talk a lot about interdependence, you know, so um, we're expecting our franchisees. I talk about, you know, um, the, the brands that I'm representing, we expect our franchisees to be, um, independent and take responsibility for themselves and their business but to know that they can rely on us and call on us should they need to and vice versa you know as the um as the franchisor you know we we have to rely on our franchisees to um grow the business you know and it's uh, an interdependence so i think it's it's everyone's responsibility ed um but i think communication's key and honesty you know if someone's dropped the ball just be honest you know the franchisor yeah. can't always get it right every time the franchisee can't always get it right you know communication talk 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 you know don't hide behind emails i think that's something that you know in the 21st century we're all a bit guilty of you know oh, yeah. i'll try and clear these problems up uh, by sending a barrage of emails and they can be misread or they can be misinterpreted so pick up the phone organize a zoom call or when we can let's let's do a face to face over a coffee and you know things get sorted out far easier and far quicker that way yeah it makes sense definitely and um we've obviously worked together for a, for a couple of years and I've, I've seen you do that and there's there's been some significant challenges come your way at times and um you know you you managed to to handle that take on that responsibility and, and feed back to the to the individuals and uh you know some of the testimonials you have on your linkedin profile are a testament to that that the relationship that you've built with the the franchisees so um yeah it's re it's really interesting to see you confirm that <laughs> today you know in, in in us talking but um the next question that i wanted to to, to ask you is um is franchising for everyone you know um i think the, the audience that hopefully are listening to this, maybe some some people are thinking I might be self-employed and might just be looking for another job. What is this franchising business all around? Is it for me? Um, you know, I, I want to be kind of open and transparent about it. So is it for everyone, do you think? I, I definitely don't think it's for everybody. Um, I think it's an amazing business model. Um, and then within that, of course, you've got lots of, sectors and lots of um you know different business propositions so it's again um you're really testing me today ed you, you know some <laughs> great great questions and uh yeah i i think that's the wonderful thing about franchising is there's you know i think at last count nearly a thousand um different uh, business models or systems franchise systems in in the uk currently and obviously more when you go you know further afield but no it's not for everybody because i think you have to be honest with yourself at, are you a self-employed person? You know, and that's a difficult question. Um, if you've always been a, an employed person, how do you actually know? You know, how do you actually, is there a way, probably not an easy way of testing it or testing yourself, you know, but I think there are some questions that you can ask yourself, you know, um, you know, are you willing to, to work more than your contracted hours? Or are you, you know, do you understand that your, your, you know, your earnings could be or should be commensurate to your effort and, and your work rate? You know, I think that's generally what, you know, what appeals to most people uh, about self-employment. Now, everybody wants the, the great work-life balance, you know, earning more while spending more time with the family. I think everybody loves that kind of utopia. Um, but in the, in the short term, building a business it's the total opposite of that. Let's be honest. You know, yeah. you, you know, when, when you start even a franchise, although you cut out some of that, um, I guess uh, some of the pitfalls at the beginning, you know, you can just run the business and launch the business without setting up a website or without learning how to uh, perfect your process or, or, or whatnot. And you might even get into a brand that brings you customers, you know, that, that would be um, another accelerator. Um, but even so you've still got, you know, 
a couple of years or more of really hard graft, you know, the long hours and, 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 the, and the kind of slog to build your business to a level that you really want it. So no, it's not for everybody, um, but for the right people, I think it's, um, you know, a, a, an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I, I have to agree. But uh, I, I go a little bit further and say that some people may may think that franchising is just a business in a box, you know, it's it's ready made, it's guaranteed success. Um, and they, they need to go into it with their eyes open and make sure that they uh, not only prepared themselves, but they actually understand what they're getting themselves into fully. Because what you mentioned there, you know, you, you're still a self employed person, it's still a business that you're you're running for yourself. Um, you just avoiding some of the pitfalls like you say but um that's still challenging it's still uh, a, t- a tough thing to overcome but if you've got the right mindset you can do it the, the, the franchisors should provide the right support like you've you've already gone through already so i want to change kind of pace and move it back to your career a little bit now um okay so in terms of your your career overall have you had any um strange things take place weird or or, or funny kind of uh, moments that you can share with us yeah uh, you're really digging out all the, all the skeletons <laughs> ed um I, I guess there's always yeah there's always a few incidents over the years uh, if i if i wind back to my you know my sort of uh, days in jewelry um high street jewelry which i i'm very fond of by the way you know it was a, it was my whilst all my friends um and uh yeah, all my friends were off at college and university. Um, I was a sort of college dropout. So I dropped, I, I dropped into retail as a lot of people did, yeah. uh, you know, kind of uh, back then. And, um, but I, I consciously as a 16, 17 year old kid, you know, I consciously decided that that was my career that was going to be my thing rather than it just being this job that maybe uh, gets me by. I, I consciously said, I'm going to, gain every qualification I'm going to try and hit every target I'm going to make this my degree you know I'm going to make this my uh, you know my pathway um, so yeah very fond of my days in jewelry but on my first day when they said look you know you've got to wear a suit you've got to wear a tie you got I, I had absolutely no clue no clue what what I was doing I, I kind of bought this uh, this stuff and then you come to tie the tie for the first time and there was no YouTube back then so you couldn't you know <laughs> You couldn't cheat or watch it. You talk. So I just effectively tied it in some sort of uh, tight knot. I looked like a, a bit of a joke, but, you know, it ticked the box. And I went in to start my training, my first shift, uh, you know, really nervous as hell. And I'm, I'm stood in, it was in Milton Keynes, actually. That's where I used to live uh, in a play. And, and it was a shop called Leslie Davis, very prestigious, part of the Signet group. And um I was stood in the middle of the shop floor and you had these really, really hot lamps, hot lights, you know, these were pre LEDs. So these were, you know, these were as good as heaters. Um, so we, you know, it was getting on for 20 odd degrees and I was, uh, you know, burning up. And um, next thing I know, after receiving this training, I'm then being woken up by all the, uh, all the staff and the supervisor that was training me. And, uh, you know, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, what, what, what happened? They said, you fainted, you know, you, <laughs> you, you were stood there one minute and then the next minute you've gone to ground. And, uh, effectively I just choked myself to death with this tie and mm-hmm. cut off the blood flow, I think to my head. And, um, you know, uh, I did manage to keep my job, which was the the plus side. <laughs> and I think one of my dear colleagues then showed me a better way of tying the tie. So I didn't, uh, I didn't pass out every shift. Fantastic. So did you learn anything from that? Or was it just literally just how to tie, tie, a, uh, tie a tie? <laughs> how to how to tie a tie and maybe um, manage your nerves as well. I mean, you know, you have to go through these uh, embarrassing moments, don't you as, yeah. as a as a, as a kid, as an adult, as a, you know, uh, so yeah, I think how to manage your nerves. I, I was, you know, dead nervous. I was, uh, it was like my 16th birthday. I think, you know, I was, um, really eager as, like I said, I was always sort of, uh, in my friend's shadows a little bit. They were, you know, this year or six months older, which, you know, never sounds like a lot, does it? But as a, as a, you know, uh, whilst I'm still a, you know, a younger kid, they're off getting their jobs and things. So I was kind of playing catch up. Um, but yeah, no, definitely, definitely a great, you know, great experience. Uh, and it, I think it served me well and it was a really good springboard for my, you know, my, my career. Yeah. And, and actually I just, 
just realized there was there was something in 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 that that relates to franchising a little bit you know you didn't have the experience of tying the knot yourself <laughs> right on your on your tie and, and you passed out but if um if if you take the advice and support of the others around you who've done this before know what they're doing you know you're going to avoid that pitfall so yeah no good good analogy and um you know i was i was embarrassed and and look you know to keep that analogy going i think sometimes franchisees can be embarrassed you know because it is uncomfortable when you don't know the answer to something or you you know what's the expression you know you don't know what you don't know and that and that's a really um you know frustrating place to be sometimes but uh you know and again i come back to relationships openness honesty you know there's no i always say to my franchisees there's no such thing as a daft question you know don't don't sit there and suffer in silence don't do, that will be painful much more painful for you you know just ask the question you know um and that's what i love about children because they're never afraid you know that they're, they're almost um, to the point of irritation you know they'll why why and how and when and how and why and they have no problem in doing that um it's only as adults we seem to develop that complex or oh, better not ask it's probably not the right time or place to ask that and i don't want to be seen as daft so i won't yeah. ask the question which is which is a shame isn't it so i think that's something i try and live by if you don't know just just ask the question Yes, it's it's so true. My my two are upstairs stomping around at the moment, um, but they um, I, the more I look at them and see how they learn and interact with the world, the more I realise that, you know, they're they're better human beings than us in many ways. Yeah, sure they 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 have more tantrums and things like this, but actually they're more inquisitive. They're more they're more um, busy trying to to learn and understand and engage with people in ways that, yeah, we've lost as we've we've turned into adults and become kind of a bit more professional and reserved and um yeah i think you can learn a lot from from children but um yeah totally agree but g going back to franchising and franchisees so uh i mean uh, how many franchisees do you think you've supported over the years rough number good question yeah good question i i i would struggle ed i think you know um hundreds and hundreds maybe a thousand yeah may may maybe a thousand actually if if i really if i really think about it um yeah you know at one point back in in venture photography you know we had a uh, hundred franchisees and of course you've always got some uh, attrition as well people retiring and people joining so uh, by virtue I, I worked with more than a hundred in, in in that brand and then um expense reduction analysts I, you know i was i was with those guys for over nine years and um you know as you're as you're well aware ed you know they're fantastic um, brand and they've got you know hundreds and hundreds of uh, franchisees worldwide um so yeah i think uh, and then in the brands that i'm with you know now so i represent launch life with it which is a um a cluster of uh, education based uh, franchise companies and um you know we've currently got 260 franchisees worldwide so yeah it's you know it's a pretty big number but i love it you know i really love it it tests you it stretches you as a as a as a person as a franchisor um which i guess is how i identify it, it you know you you get stretched you get tested but i really love it because there's no bigger reward for me anyway when a you know when a franchisee um really makes it you know really kind of um, achieves I've, I've seen so many people i lose count now that have genuinely achieved their dream you know they'll join and they're that bag of nerves and they um you know really impressionable and and they'll i'll say look what is it you're looking to achieve you know not not talking about earning some cash or you know retiring at whatever um what is it you're you know and it might be a holiday home or it might be you know uh, yeah, it might be retiring by a certain age or allowing my you know other half to give you know to stop working or whatever it might be you know a real kind of um, aspiration and it's lovely when that transpires and for some people it's a ferrari on the drive way or whatever um but you know being knowing you've played your part in that is uh, you know is, is a massive reward are there any success stories that stick out in your mind like somebody was uh, trying to achieve something and then they did through building this business under a franchise brand yeah i think i think the one the one that sticks out or the one sorry the ones that stick out over the years are um you know where where people buy holiday homes i think that's something really tangible you know it's a, it's a you know huge investment so you've got to you've got to create you know proper money to to get to make that happen yeah. you know you've got to create um some serious uh, additional income to to make that happen um Unless so it's yeah a i would say <laughs> 
Yeah, unless it's a beach hut. Yeah, but if it's, you know, if it's really something nice and desirable, you know, we all yeah. know how hard it is to try and uh, raise, you know, a spare six-figure sum um, to to go and uh, realise that. And I've I've seen that. You know, I'm now losing count of the amount of franchisees who have, uh, you know, who have who have achieved that level of success. You know, it's nice to buy a shiny car, but you know, let's face it, we, you know there's finance, there's schemes, there's, you know, 20, 30,000 quid would get you a nice car. Whereas, you know, when somebody's able to put half a million quid to buy their dream, you know, retirement home or holiday home, that is, uh, that that's really special. So yeah, a few of those stick in my, in my mind, Ed. Well, it's not just the home itself, is it? I guess it's the lifestyle as well. You know, it's, it's b- being able to afford yourself the time to go and enjoy um, different scenery, different food, different culture, that kind of thing. That's, that's probably what a lot of people aspire to do. Um, I can do it through finding money, but you know, it's, um, I don't think money's the be all and end all, I guess is what I'm saying with that. But yeah, anyway, so in, in terms of the successful franchisees, then what do you think makes a successful franchisee? Um, good question. So I think, um, I would always say attitude and behavior, you know, having, having that real kind of, um, self-motivation that is key you know that is key if you know again if you believe that you rely on other people to get you motivated then you might not be uh you know ready or or or, or right for for a self-employment uh, journey or a franchise journey um and i think the other thing that that would definitely make a successful franchisee is the ability to follow the model follow the system follow the manual in in many cases because I think, you know, we're all maybe a bit maverick at times. Oh, there's got to be a better way or a quicker way. Or, you know, I I reckon it might work if I do it like this. You know, we all have those moments. We're only human. But I think franchising is is built on the opposite of that, really. Um, there, There has to be some room for let's call it, you know, flair or, or innovation. Um, but I think that comes much later, you know, when you're a new fr- And I think that, you know, I'll always caveat, Ed, you know, that question almost, there's one answer for your, your new franchisees, and there's perhaps a slightly different answer for your uh, more mature franchisees who have achieved that level of, yeah. um, of success. Because as a new franchisee, you, you, your job is to cut out all the risks, you know, don't introduce risk. Um, and in your head, you know, and, and your, your, your brain will play tricks on you. Yeah, but if you do it like this, despite what the franchisor has told you, it might be better, might be better being the, you know, operative word. Um, it probably won't be, you know, so follow the system because the system works, you know, that, that is something I've always clung to. And, and uh, you know, occasionally someone will prove you wrong. You know, someone will say, well, I did it my maverick way, but it's not often more often you're in that situation where um, you don't want to say to that franchisee who's gone, you know, on a maverick path that, you know, I told you so. Um, but often they, they know it. You don't need to say it. it's like, OK, yeah, point taken. I'll, I'll reach back for my operations manual and I'll follow it like you, uh, you know, you encourage me to do. Yeah, I guess if you're going to invest the amount of money you need to invest to, to, to buy a franchise and that can be, you know, 5000 to millions, can't it? If, you, if you're buying yeah. multi site sort of uh, franchises, um, well, think, you, think you're doing that for it. a reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to look, follow think, someone think else's about... path and advice, take their advice. Yeah, look. I think a good a good analogy that I often use is um, is like your IKEA flat pack furniture. You know, we um, especially us guys. You know, I think uh, my my wife is much better with a set of instructions than I am. But uh, you get it out of the box; it only looks like a pile of you know sections and a pile of screws or whatever. And um, we often try to put it together without the help of the instructions. And I don't think I've ever achieved um, you know success that way. Uh, I'm always you know five screws. Uh, left over or the panels don't quite line up and uh, you know my wife proceeds to say look take it apart I've got the instructions and I know where you've gone wrong you know and uh, as frustrating as that is as infuriating as that is you know you you follow the step by step by step um, and it works out and you've got a lovely bit of furniture at the end of it you know so I think um, it's a it's a really good uh, you know analogy to sort of bring into franchising you know if you follow the model you, you will more likely get there. I really like that <laughs> because um, I guess the franchise is the, the 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 flat pack chair or shelf or whatever it is that you've bought. Yeah. But the um, 
I guess self-employment in relation to that then is a lump of wood, right? <laughs> Build it yourself. <laughs> you, you, you've you've yeah, got to yeah. chop it up and find the right way to make it, you know, do all yeah. the structural engineering and, and whatever else it takes yeah. to build that shelf or set of shelves. Whereas the franchise, uh, you know, the flat pack furniture, it's already there. You just need to do it yeah. yourself. You've still got to put that hard work in, but perhaps you're, you're going to avoid some of the pitfalls of, of starting off with a lump of wood yeah <laughs> absolutely i'll leave that with you ed you can keep hold of that one yeah I, i'm gonna develop that i'm gonna develop it some more and see where <laughs> we can take that <laughs> but um let, let, let's talk now about um your current role and, and and what you're covering because i think uh, you, as you said it's educational franchises um that you're you're overseeing at the moment or different brands within that um, I think right now we, we, we mentioned it earlier homeschooling and um, mm. being a real challenge for a lot of families how does the business that you're in now tie into that and you know how is it coping with the uh, the challenges we've seen over the last year or so you know COVID and lockdowns and things yeah, like yeah. this yeah there's there's been a few hasn't there well um, so I should say that the you know the company that I belong to is um, Launch Life International. So um, Launch Life International is a uh, umbrella group of companies that um, specialize only in education and training um, deployed through a franchise model. So those those are our kind of, um, you know, our, our focuses, I guess. Um, and uh, the, the business was formed you know, not long ago, if I say, you know, four or five years ago, um, and it started with a company called Academy of Learning Career College in Canada. So um, similar to Pittman Training, I'll come on to that, um, 50 career colleges across Canada helping, you know, adults um, with vocational learning. So um, they can access, uh, you know, this this form of higher education to gain um qualifications and certifications into a certain career path so that's the academy of learning and then um, since then uh, Pittman training was you know was acquired into the launch life family um, and Pittman training has over 80 uh, training centers across the UK Ireland and um, further afield actually um, so uh, that's Pittman training does very similar to what the academy of learning does um, and we have school is easy as well which is um, quite different to those two the, the same insofar as it's education based but this is aimed at children rather than adults and it's private tutoring effectively ed but uh, you know to a very very high standard um and uh, as you say with you know with the year that we've you know we've all lived through uh, and are still living through um and the the sort of learning loss um especially in, in in children who haven't been able to go to school all that much um you know there is a bit of a gap there and, and we're getting you know lots of demand on on the uh the private tutoring for children at the moment to try and catch up you know so um i feel really fortunate to be part of a a, a business uh, and and a um cluster of brands that is you know focused on on education and, and helping people our, our strap line at Pittman training is um transforming careers changing lives you know and that was um that was a huge kind of motivator for me what i didn't say ed is i um decided to join the company in august last year so august 2020 mid pandemic you know we we were yeah. i think we might have been momentarily out of lockdown at that point which perhaps gave me a little bit more um you know uh, impetus but uh, nevertheless it was a precarious time to be changing jobs but uh, i was so compelled by um by what launch life were doing and what pitman training were doing that i took the leap of faith and you know six months on i'm, I'm delighted that i did i'm really really enjoying it and and feel like we are um making a big contribution to society, you know, to, to the communities that we serve, you know, helping people who, who don't have jobs to gain the skills to get back into um, employment. The amount of people now that are switching industry, let alone jobs, you know, they're saying, wow, you know, I was, I was having a great career in hospitality and that's come to an abrupt, you know, stop or an abrupt end, uh, you know, in retail as well. You know, if you've been yeah. a, let's say a, a Debenhams manager for, you know, 20 years or, or something like this, you know, where do you go after that? You know, you, you don't go back to a big retailer necessarily because, you know, who's the next casualty on the high street? You know, I think that's what we're all thinking. So we're, we're serving lots of, um, 
students at Pittman training who are saying, you know, how can I jump out of retail into computing or, or out of hospitality into, you know, maybe um, a secretarial role or whatever it might be, you know, a complete career change. So, you know, it's, uh, it's been a great experience so far for me. So there's a couple of things I'll take from that. So myself in my, my own career, uh, I've gone through a career change, I'd say twice. Um, some people might say the most recent change is pretty similar, but the first one was going from working as a, a, a well, I put up marquees for a living. I did that for mm-hmm. uh, pretty much eight years, and I spent three years of that trying to get out of it and trying to find uh, an office-based job because I was intelligent enough to do it. I just, after school, had, um, you know, been attracted to the money and um, was with my friends, and it was good fun, you know, until I realized that I needed a proper career, and um yeah, it's really difficult because nobody looks at your CV when you've got just one uh, role or one uh, sector and thinks, oh, they can transition into something different. Mm-hmm. All the recruiters, and I've been a recruiter that's been in that situation, um, looks at that CV and thinks it's it's easy for that person to transition. So let's let's put them forwards or let's interview them. Um, and then to learn the skill sets as well. So for me, moving into an office, you know, what's Excel? What's a database? I'm used to yeah. a sledgehammer and, you know, a van. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, it's, it can be quite a, a big challenge for people. So I think the Pittman training centers are, are, are really interesting. But the other thing as well is, so I used to recruit for um, uh, administrator, administrators, PA. And so I, I recognize the Pittman brand as helping um, accountants and helping uh, PAs to up, up their typing speed and things like this. But um, since speaking with you more recently, uh, I realize there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? There's a lot of different online courses as well as the the office based, yeah. or, or sorry, um, center based training as well. So could you just explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I should, I should say, Ed, that, you know, Typically, our our model is, um, you know, 80, 90 percent of our students opt to come into the training centers. You know, we've got these um, think of them as micro colleges. You know, they're they're really, you know, nice, comfortable environment uh, that you can sit and use our facilities to do your studies. And sometimes getting away from, um, you know, uh, getting away from the house, you know, the barking dogs or the, you know, the kind of um, frantic children, you know, it can be quite a nice um, you know, oasis to, to actually study in one of our, you know, nice relaxed training centers. However, you know, of course, um, you know, COVID and, and the, uh, the lockdowns has meant that we've had to close our centers repeatedly. Um, the great news is we've managed to take everything online and that's been, um, that's been crucial, you know, absolutely. So we haven't stopped trading all the way throughout. We've had to pivot to use, you know, to use that um, expression and we've had to, you know, uh, change and adapt. But, um, you know, all of our students have been looked after and, uh, They've managed to complete their their studies and their assessments online in many cases. So that's uh, you know that's certainly been key over these last few few months. But you know, coming to your question, yeah. So Pittman is over 180 years old. I guess famous for the um, you know Pittman short shorthand, shorthand um, yeah. method yeah. methodology. Um, and then you know, fast forward uh, a number of you know decades, uh, we were then helping people to use typewriters and and uh, get you know adept at, at doing that and then um fast forward a few more decades we were teaching people how to use computers and then teaching them how to use microsoft um suite and uh, and then fast forward to present day you know we're now looking at what career paths are uh, people needing or wanting to break into so one of our most popular diplomas at the moment is a virtual assistant diploma you know i'm sure sir isaac Pittman, you know would never have imagined that that's where his business would have uh, ended up um another you know another area that we're really getting deep into now is um software and web development you know, because, of course, people are looking at, well, what career can I break into that um, I can do from home, or I can do virtually, or what career is recession proof, or pandemic proof. So, you know, we're we're sort of um, catering for those needs and, and those demands, we still 
uh, help on a massive um, scale, you know, accountants and bookkeepers, people who want to break into that. It's a wonderful career uh, for people. Um, yeah, every area of IT computing, um, as well as, you know, administration and, and secretarial. Um, yeah, the, the list goes on, but I've given you a few, yeah. uh, a few, few of the areas. Perfect. And, and do you ever get self-employed people or consultants approaching uh, the training centers and, and taking the courses? Is it useful for them as well? Or is it just for people trans- transitioning careers? No, re- it really is everybody, Ed. You know, we, we were having this conversation just yesterday. You know, we have uh, a business startup diploma. So that okay. is something, you know, you, you've just sort of uh, reminded me about it. You know, uh, maybe there's a link back to franchising, you know, um, if uh, somebody who maybe is scared or, 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 or apprehensive about the world of, uh, you know, the world of self-employment, come and take our business startup diploma because it, it talks to you about, you know, what skills you would need, what tools you will need, you know, what, um, you know, what, what things you'll need to bring into your, you know, into your business. Um, yeah. So we have, we have a lot of business owners who like to send their staff. So um, we have corporate relationships, you know, if, if uh, let's say you've got a great, um apprentice you know you could have a great apprentice or or a great you know junior person in your business you might think you know they know nothing about accounting but they've got the right attitude the right you know behaviors um because you can't really buy that and it's you know back to franchising you know attitudes and and behaviors um are innate aren't they you know you're kind of born with it and um uh, you've either got it or you haven't whereas skills can be you know borrowed or or, or learned and um, you know that's where you know that that's where our proposition becomes attractive to corporate companies who say yeah we've got these people who've got the right attitude we're going to send them your way to get the right skills to become whether it's an accountant or a manager or whatever it might be yeah and I, th- I think that the the attitude is that the the human currency of the future i think in in terms of em, em, employment and 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 work because ai is coming right for for a lot of the, the yeah. skills that that are already there and that well if you look at the uh, industrial revolution um technology came for um people uh, sewing you know or um working in, in manufacturing that's now been taken over by 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 robots, I guess, um, is mm-hmm. the way to describe them. So the workforce has had to, to reskill or human beings have had to reskill. And I think, yeah, attitude, curiosity, these things that we've talked about already, they're, they're going to be key moving forward. So, um, yeah, it, it, interesting to hear you kind of talk about it in that that way and and how a, a company owner might see that as, as within their members of staff. So, uh, yeah, if if anybody's obviously listening to this and they're, they're looking to change career, franchising is not for them, definitely should check you guys out. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about with um, the, the brands that you're, you're, you're managing under Launch Life is what do the franchisees do? Are these people that are going out there and, and delivering the training courses? Uh, you know, what's their role? What, what's the business that they would buy into? Yeah. Um, so I guess it differs ever so slightly from brand to brand. Um, but what all of our brands um, have in common, and I should have mentioned earlier, Ed, that our most recent recent acquisition uh, of only a couple of months ago was a company called Engineering for Kids. Um, okay. And that's uh, another very exciting one for us um, because that's all based on, you know, STEM uh, education, um, you know, so science, technology, um, and mechanics so you've got you know that type of learning uh, that not all schools are you know are kind of um, delivering you know so having fun with you know robotics and having fun with uh, engineering and um, yeah so that's uh, something that we're now you know we're now kind of rolling out to even more territories um, but to answer your your question about you know what do our franchisees do of course they have to um in the Pittman case, it's a training centre. Yeah, so we choose. That's very much you know based on geography. So we look at the right territory for for that franchisee. Um, often they want to be you know close to their their home. That that goes without yeah. saying, but uh, is not a you know is not a prerequisite. Um, and uh, you know we support that person to uh, find the best location to you know 
create their training center um, based on certain standards and certain guidelines. And then they are the representative in that, you know, in that town or city or location. Um, a lot of our franchisees expand beyond that first one as well. And that's, um, that's a great way to sort of see uh, exponential uh, revenue growth and, and great, you know, profits, great returns. Um, we, in the most part, certainly in Pittman, we do a lot of marketing on our franchisees behalf. So we're, we're delivering, you know, probably 50% or more of their required leads and inquiry wow. volume so um that becomes quite attractive to people you know say so, okay wow so if i do my own local marketing that will also be supplemented by the um the franchisor bringing me all these inquiries so that's something that uh, you know we do for most of our brands um prob probably less so in in the school is easy case because that is all about um your your immediate you know micro community you know it's about um you know the sort of uh, mums and dads uh you know at the school gates and and understanding you know who needs private tutoring etc so um yeah it's something people tend to look far more you know locally and word of mouth is is a huge um you know is, is a huge kind of marketing tool for us on on the school is easy business um but yeah so our franchisees become the representative and and you know we expect them to uphold the brand and and uh, uphold our standards and values and and do a exemplary job in their in their territory and you know i'm pleased to say all of our franchisees kind of uh, you know do exactly that so we you know we we but we explain that to any person looking to join our brand that you know we are um the best out there and and we need people who can you know uphold all of those um you know high standards perfect Look, I think it's probably about time to wrap up um, the, the conversation. Um, thank you for sharing so much of your time with me. But um, for the people that have been been listening, I wanted to to find out um, from you, what's your one piece of advice about the, the franchise and industry? What what one thing that would you give to somebody who was thinking, OK, let's let's look at this. What, what, what should I be looking for? Yeah, so just one thing, Ed. Um, <laughs> there's never just one. I would research 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 you know i, th I think um often people get excited by a, a brand because they like it or they like the product or or um yeah they've just fallen in love with it that's you know be careful with that be careful it doesn't mean that it's um it's going to be right for you and it might not be actually very profitable or very um you know very effective so i would say research as much as you can, you know, ask the questions um, and and dig beneath the surface. You know, I think uh, you know, everything, you know, everything can look good, you know, from the outside, but really get under the skin. Talk to the franchisees who are in that network because the franchisor will obviously give you the the best version of of the truth. Um, but the franchisees tend to pull no punches. You know, they will tell you exactly what the business is doing. Um, you need to be careful with that as well because if you get uh, you know a grumpy franchisee on the wrong day, then they can obviously talk it into the ground. Um, so take a you know take a sort of um, cross section of of different franchisees and their feedback. But the other thing, I, if I can go for two ed would be sure challenge whether it is recession proof and pandemic proof and i wouldn't have said that to you you know maybe a year ago but i i, I look at the industry now i i you know do uh, work with the bfa and and i try and look at the industry as a whole and give back where possible and uh, i do now find myself wondering you know which brands are pandemic proof and which ones are not you know there's um a large proportion of, of franchise brands who are currently um, shelved for want of a better expression, currently inactive, obviously unfair of me to, you know, mention any, but that, you know, you can just kind of um, imagine, you know, some of the sport and leisure ones, some of the hospitality ones, um, you know, some of the retail ones, you know, they've been forced to close and that's, uh, you know, that that's a hard hand to be dealt. So if you're looking at getting into franchising, I would ask that question as well. Is it pandemic proof? I, I think I agree with you in some ways there, but I also think it's down to the leaders of those businesses, you know, um, because I've heard some some really nice stories of um, brands that were reliant on, you know, having a classroom full of people or uh, having, you know, customers come through their doors, but actually they've transitioned to to online really well. And because of the, 
the kind of community of entrepreneurs that are within a, a franchise brand, they've managed to find those solutions quicker than maybe the, the business person would do on their own. So I think a lot of finding out if they're recession proof or pandemic proof can be what's what are the leaders like you know what, what are the people yeah. that are actually running this business like and i think it just comes back to that again that that research yeah. that you said and getting to know them so it's a new it's a new question isn't it you know we've put together yeah. our sort of um covid statement i think we've called it you know which is this is what we did during covid for our franchisees because um we had to exactly transition you know we were as i say 80 90 percent uh face to face and, and we're now you know 80, 90, 100%, you know, online for the time being. Um, so, you know, we explain that to people, you know, that's how we became um, pandemic proof. You know, we we, uh, we didn't really legislate for it. It just, you know, um, it happened, didn't it? And we had to uh, very, very quickly adapt. Um, so yeah, most brands would have would have done it, exactly that. And look, for those, those um, franchise uh, businesses who have had to cease trading for a while um the good times will come back right so uh, yeah. in fact they may even they may even come back stronger you know i think people will be uh, you know will be itching to to get active again and to get you know face to face and to go and enjoy themselves again and uh, and go and spend their money as well you know i'm, I'm listening that whilst it's it's tough out there the money in people's banks is is accumulating because you can't go on holiday. You might not buy a car. You might not, you know, splash the cash. So it's uh, the money in people's bank accounts is is going up and up and up. So at some point that needs to be spent. And uh, you know, if 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 it can be spent with with our brands, great. You know, so um, watch this space, I guess. I'm sorry to say mine's going to be spent on a holiday to Italy or something like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, you're you're right. You know, people are, are are not going out as much, not spending. And so they're starting to accumulate some money. And um, yeah, at some point, there's going to be this desire to um, to go wild again, you know, party again and have fun and, and buy new things and, and go new places. So yeah, the, the good times will come back for for sure. It's it's, it's happened time and time again in history but um look i'm gonna leave it there before i start waffling about uh you know 1964 or something like that when something happens <laughs> <laughs> but uh paul it's been you, been really enjoyable speaking to you again i really appreciate your time thank you very much for oh, likewise for sharing your 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 stories with me and um yeah for for sharing your advice with everybody about uh, the franchise and industry so thank you very much yeah well straight straight back at you ed it's been my pleasure thank you ever so much for having me on and uh, yeah good luck with everything you're doing thanks very much take care thank you bye-bye cheers bye